Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Winter Data Meetup. I hope you all enjoyed the insightful talks and discussions we had so far. Meet, meet our team of experts from Ivan. Join them for a captivating talk where they will share their insights into transform, in transforming machine learning models into production-ready recommender system. Don't miss this opportunity to learn about seamless model development, maintenance, and monitoring anchored in a real-world case study developed in a club with this team. Now, before we dive into our session, I'd like to take a moment for you to ask for your support in helping us grow in our community and recognize speakers. Firstly, if you all enjoyed the content we are providing I want and want to stay updated on future events and talks, please click like and subscribe buttons below this video. Now for something a bit special, in the video description below, you will find the link to the talk page where you can provide your feedback to the talk, give speakers badges and rate the session if you like or if you don't like it. Through the, through the talk, if you have any burning questions or insights you'd like to share, don't hesitate to type them into the chat box. Our team will be monitoring the chat briefly and we'll also collect questions uh, to discuss them uh, with the speakers after the presentation. And now, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome our speakers to share their valuable insights with us. Guys, floor is yours. Hello, colleagues. Uh, uh, nice to meet you. My name is Marek. Today, I will uh, back up two of my colleagues, uh, Michał and Marek, who, who couldn't join, but we are still here with Tomek and Sheriff and would like to tell you quite interesting story about productization of recommender system uh, that is aligning to MLOps uh, practices. So let's first start maybe um, with uh, the situation with data we currently observe and the number of, you know, quite advanced tools uh, that are available and more and more broadly used by industries. And uh, that's what was as well we observe uh, together with, with our clients in a, uh, in, in a collaboration. One of such a tools is our recommender systems. And later on, I will deep dive uh, deeper into what is it and uh, will present you kind of a foundational knowledge so that you know what we are talking about. Um, in general, all the machine learning tools, we must understand, they uh, require a bit different approach than standard development. So in standard development, the whole process is more deterministic, which means uh, we estimate what's to be done, uh, we develop, and, and it's working. In machine learning, it's working the same. However, we cannot estimate how well it's going to work. And what we observe now in many, many industries and enterprises is that uh, there are lots of departments working on machine learning models, trying to solve kind of a complex problem. Some of them successfully, some of them less successfully. Uh, however, all this experimentation that's required uh, to solve the problem with uh, ML models is not covered by us today. What we anticipate at certain moment, uh, uh, the selected you know, department in, a, in an organization uh, su is successful with this task, which means uh, they already figure out the good data representation, extracted all the features they need, they model the problem uh, properly with, uh, with available tools, tested it, and uh, it all appears to be very valuable for the business. The challenge is then how to make it work in production. And you know, with with a number of uh, of tools like computer vision, uh, language processing, uh, classification, and regression as a standard machine learning task, it's all quite complex, and that's why so many teams need to work on it. However, productization is a little bit of similar. So we need to, uh, in a structured way, uh, with a very solid engineering, go with it to production. And of course, we, we can you know, do even more advanced topics like prescriptive analytics, which more or less is like an exploration of various possibilities to, to leverage the, the machine learning uh, capabilities, like, for instance, uh, exploring with a heuristic search the, the inputs of the model and uh, advise which are the best, most, uh, most effective for, uh, for our clients. And of course, focusing on those that can, that can be decided, not those that are just uh, observed. Uh, today, we will focus on the last topic you see on this screen is operationalization of AI, which means on uh, how we want to make machine learning moving in production smoothly and in a controlled way, in a secure sense so that people can understand what's happening. We will also struggle about a bit different topics than just technical. Uh, later, Tomek will present you um, 
why is it also important to focus on uh, governance of it and and what kind of a way we can do to uh, to make it happen uh, okay let's let's go to the next slide yeah and with all of those tasks um, we can achieve different levels of uh, maturity uh, which means we can stop with very simple uh, solution when you know you run something in a, in a computer locally then you type it to the paper sheet and send it to colleague to to just consume the results and of course we uh, go forward and uh, we would like to achieve a bit bigger uh, maturity processes so make it more repeatable uh, operational to have a good and proper monitoring for all the machine learnings and this is all growing maturity of your MLOps uh, setup. The goal is, of course, always clear. We want to de decrease the time to market for machine learning models. And of course, we would like to deliver more and more in the same time. Meanwhile, uh, doing it a trustworthy way. So we need to understand what's happening with, uh, with our solution and why the solution is uh, presenting particular results, whether there is any, any challenge that in time uh, to our model. So what uh, maybe we can observe kind of a concept or a drift or shift uh, that is macro factory changing uh, quality of our models. And we need to we need to observe all of this. Another important thing is, of course, data quality, because whenever we talk about uh, machine learning, uh, the better data, uh, the more reliable, the better results. If the data is uh, of low quality, even if we the, the model, you know, in the testing, uh, reports quite a good results we may be very surprised uh, due to for instance overfitting so data quality is another important aspect that will be covered uh, later today uh, by sheriff and maybe that's uh, all with this very introductory speech about the motivation of this talk and uh, what we would like to focus on and let us uh, jump forward and start with uh, more uh, let's say real content so uh, it's still introductory so let's first understand what are the recommender systems and how we position this uh, this discussion so whenever we talk about products and items uh, we are we, we want to find in the internet or or, or any other you know e-commerce platform we know there are a plethora of them and if we consider ourselves as users or customers entering those platforms there are also a plethora of users so we've got you know hundreds of thousands of or even million users and hundreds of thousands or even million products and then we figure out that finding the right one is not uh, the easiest thing and you know this dilbert uh, short memo is not solving our problems for sure uh, but showing that the let's see old schoolish approaches were also somehow working in this area Today, majority uh, of recommender systems we can classify into two, let's say, major groups. One would be the content-based, uh, and the other would be collaborative filtering. Uh, let me a little bit explain you what does it mean. Uh, an example: for instance, when you enter uh, some keywords uh, in Google, and then you see kind of a very similar ads to what you just taped. Or maybe in Google Shopping, you see the similar products based on this content you just taped in. Then we're thinking about content-based filtering. Uh, such approaches usually refer to your profile uh, or just a content similarity to what you've searched already on, on or what you are looking for now. For instance, if uh, you browse in a, one of the e-commerce solution for particular products and then you switch somewhere else, you see very similar ads. And it means uh, these ads simply analyze the content, find the similarities between the other products and uh, trying to sell you something like this. Uh, how is it working? It's looking mainly on what you're looking for now and or your current interest quite explicitly expressed or encoded into your profile. I know you enter a dating uh, service, you type who you're looking for, and then based on this profile, we can find a similarity uh, to find you a proper colleague. The other approach that is getting, I think, more interest recently is collaborative filtering. In this approach, you not only look at uh, what you explicitly express you're interested in, but uh, it's more looking at your behavioral patterns, which means if in the past you've seen the similar movies and someone else, we 
consider that you may have a similar taste or similar, you know, uh, like the similar uh, gender uh, of a movie or, or, or similar actors, etc. And these solutions usually look at the historical interactions between users and items and try to um, find similar users, process them uh, together so that we can recommend based on this similarity, the, the new features and the new, uh, the new items, which is more looking for uh, similarity in behavior. Uh, there are quite of a straightforward disadvantages of both because uh, when we think about it, this looking for a similar behavior of people seems to be more natural, which means uh, it's of course uh, easy, easy to understand that if, if someone likes you know, the same drama movie, so maybe the the one that I did not see but the colleague who is similar to me if seen will also be be good and, and well matched for me. On the other hand, this faces uh, this approach faces kind of a straightforward problems. Uh, first thing, uh, out of the, all the items, all the products available, I have interactions with just a few, just a very, very small promile, uh, which means this interaction uh, graph, let's call it this, this, uh, this big graph, is quite sparse. Mm. On the other hand, uh, when I'm totally new to the system and the system has never have seen my uh, historical behavior, it's quite hard to find a matching because we have a very, uh, very limited data and such a problem is called cold start. It's, it's quite severe for uh, collaborative filtering. It's not as big problem, on the other hand, for content-based filtering, which maybe do not provide such a, you know, fantastic results, uh, but still is a little bit resilient to such situations. And for that reason, uh, we may see a number of hybridization of those methods and, and hybrid methods. And these are the most popular approaches. Uh, and of course, there are many of them. We will talk about it a little more um, on the next slide. So can we please go forward? Yeah. Let's start with this uh, very right corner. Uh, when the whole scheme I just described is presented. So we started with this graph of interactions between users and items. We figure out uh, who liked or disliked uh, the product and constructed the user item matrix. As we discussed, this matrix is very, very sparse, uh, which means uh, it's uh, not as easy. If, if I'm, you can imagine I'm the single row with such a matrix to figure out what's, uh, which of unseen products I would like to see. And uh, for that reason, we quite often uh, can solve it with so-called matrix factorization. And in fact, matrix factorization is quite of the most popular approach to uh, recommend your systems today. Uh, the general idea is to represent this matrix uh, by a factor of two or, or more uh, other matrices. Mm, if the matrix would be complete uh, without empty places, it should be quite straightforward. We could do algebraic methods for that. However, if we have kind of an empty place spaces, and there are usually a lot of them, uh, it's still feasible. Uh, we can go with a methods like, for instance, stochastic, stochastic gradient descent and try to minimize error uh, in each iteration of, of the algorithm based only on the assessment of the available and already observed interactions. Mm. One of the uh, known approach to this is SVD. The other one would be factorization machines. And uh, what we use in this, our example, uh, we, we described today, we used LightFM, uh, or, or at least the, our, our colleagues from, uh, from the client we collaborate in used uh, LightFM to solve the problem. Uh, and this is one of the uh, approaches to max factorization, but which uh, builds uh, in also not only interactions, but also kind of a content-based uh, features, which means once we uh, normally would pass the user vector to generate possible recommendations for the user. And the user vector will be built only on the, the historical interactions. Here we just extend this vector and cover also uh, features related to some, some, some content information that is uh, that, that we can provide uh, at the very beginning. Um, application of it is quite fast and uh, I've put here kind of a simplified view of how we can speed up uh, multiplication of vector and matrix so that it's it's linear it's a quite of a common knowledge uh, with a few references i provided uh, you today maybe a few other uh, things just to mention where well, we uh, focus on matrix factorization this is one of the most popular approaches but uh, of course you can use uh, any modeling technique so if you imagine that uh, 
recommendation is related to returning a set of most let's say set of 10 most fitting objects for uh, for a user we, we can uh, consider this a, a multi label learning and we can assess it with uh, i know ndcg so one of the uh, measures based on cumulative gain if we assume that's just a binary classification uh, so we have a user and item and we need to decide whether to uh, show this item to the user or not it's uh, it's Anywhere of modeling techniques, even you know, XGBT or, or deep networks, we can use to to model this problem. So, uh, depending on how we would look, want to approach, we have a plethora of solutions uh, we can use. Mm, maybe just another comment, just uh, just for your knowledge. There are of course many more extensions, uh, not only hybrid recommender systems. There are context over recommender systems, uh, which mean I can imagine myself different uh, time of the day, whether I'm at work or not. I'm, I'm totally different person. So uh, the recommender system should be able to, to align to that. We can think about session-based systems, which means when I start interaction with a system, over time, it's becoming kind of a time series of my interactions. So it's also impacting what's uh, what's happening and building sort of a context, et cetera, et cetera. So this is quite of a broad area. Mm, I think that's uh, it with the... Uh, with the introduction. Uh, one more thing, of course, this uh, data sparseness and the quality is, I think, quite visible here. Because uh, once the interactions are misleading, we or, or just content information about us are misleading, we cannot do the good predictions. End of the day, regardless which techniques we're going to use. And let me pass the voice to Tomek, uh, so that Tomek can tell you a bit more. Uh, what are the challenges we observed when going to productionalize it in industry and, and how we can respond to those? Thank you. Thanks, Marek, for a, for a good introduction and explaining what is happening under the hood on the, on the grainy detail level regarding associating individual user or client <clears throat> with individual recommendation. But from the business perspective, the question is how to take what everything that Marek talked about uh, that has been described here in the violet section. So working machine learning model and turn it into a machine learning based product. So something that is working and operating in a, in a business environment in a continuous fashion and is de delivering measurable results that can be turned into KPIs, matrices, and can provide information how much value is being derived of such product. <clears throat> and we at IPAM have a good understanding of the road that is from the ideation and framing of the problem through the exploration and development to result sharing, then to, to having a working machine learning model, to turning into an AI product via automation, but then looking into proper trainings of people and building appropriate processes monitoring and retraining of the model to ensure that they are accurate in time and then continuous delivery of results so they can be used in, in appropriate business processes. Uh, this is a diagram that our colleagues from the MLOps practice have prepared and we are very fond of it. That's why we like to share it with you. But if you, we could go please to the next slide. <clears throat> Life is not so rosy. We observe a lot of challenges and uh, especially we can we can divide them into three main areas so from the c-level officers we primarily see low total success rate we have issues with undefined effectiveness and especially we we have problems with with delivery on time and at scale so this these are these are typically mentioned main main uh, issues that we have to tackle and that's why <clears throat> the entire MLOps framework has been developed to address it in the shortest and most efficient possible way to increase the total success rate, to have more ML models being turned into AI products, to have a measurable efficiency of the cost and known uh, uh, ROI coefficients, and especially be able to scale and then increase our efficiency, not only on a single model, but on subsequent and go to the next processes. If we go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> From the business perspective, we very often do not trust what we do not understand. And again, business does not want to know how much it's going to, to cost 
and what are going to be the returns on investment, and especially with the growing and increasing governance and security around ML products, <clears throat> this is this is creating overall a reluctance in embracing larger, especially the so-called digital transformation programs. The implications are cross business, cross departmental, and affecting people on all levels. Overall, making more more problems to uh, to people. So the the ML ML ops framework is designed to make sure that business works with models that are understandable, that they are explainable, and in more detailed and and longer reaching terms, we also talk about something that we call ethical AI. We can measure the ROI and we know how much money has been invested and how it is returned throughout the working of the ML product. And then the governance and security is adhering to all the regulations, especially in more, more regulated industries such as pharmaceutical, uh, financial or insurance. If we could go please to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> from the IT perspective, very often the uh, appetite displayed by C-level officers or, or by business are very, very high, but the foundations are not there yet ready. And data quality is one of the primary issues. That's why Sharif will discuss it in more detail, how we can address that problem effectively. <clears throat> the Moving from the person with a laptop, the, the process, to type of ML factory approach, when we have multiple people working in a shared environment over multiple use cases, this is this is what has to grow, and this is what we will we will address at the end with the AI strategy affecting the entire enterprise. And of course, we cannot stop saying about runaway costs when we start with some small project that is growing because it's yielding results. But then we would like to add more and more, and then it is bringing back the situation of that has been mentioned previously. So we cannot estimate properly the ROI. We do not know where it ends. So that's that's because of these three angles of looking at it, the ML operations process has to be mature to avoid it and to make sure that the ML models are turned efficiently into AI products. If we could go to the next slide, please. So addressing the the uh, this particular use case that that we li would like to talk about, uh, we we have our client asked to build, a uh, minimum uh, production platform that will be will allow to have a nice sterile secure environment to continuously run an existing a machine learning model and turn it into an efficient ml product so we took the epam blueprint the logical blueprint of an of an ai platform and we selected the the minimum elements that are highlighted here to make sure that we have overall a working uh, platform, and at the same time that we can tackle it and make and address all the challenges that are already identified. So, if we could go to the next one, please. <clears throat> the initial scope has been uh, identified that uh, we need to move the existing uh, data ingestion pipeline, the inference for the ML model. We have to create the configurable post-processing rules that are applied to the model results, and then make sure that there is an automated uh, transfer of the results from the model into the appropriate model consumption uh, consumers. Uh, of course, the other elements were, were some additional people and processes, uh, foundational elements of an ML ops platform and the data quality. This was defined that way, so in the next future, we could build by expanding capabilities of this MVP and then move to add a fully scale AI ML analytic workbench for development. We could have a proper data quality monitoring laboratory. We could have a pro appropriate monitored consumption space where we could present, locate uh, our, our ML models and expose them for different methods of consumption, everything enveloped with a state-of-the-art machine learning operating framework for proper code validation, versioning, security, and quality. And if we could go to the next one, please. So this is the architecture of the MVP platform uh, that we are, we are nearing completion right now. It's based on AWS Cloud, where we have uh, an Athena database from which we retrieve 
the uh, the data that is passed through the uh, data quality uh, selection with uh, the great expectations framework, which Sheriff will discuss in more details, returns and stores the information in the Google Cloud, which later on can be retrieved for the machine learning recommender model. The code of the model is uh, retrieved from the GitHub repository, passed through the uh, SonarCube analyzer upon request, passive code analyzer. Uh, then the container is uh, started on ECS Fargate. Container uh, has uh, MLflow server enabled to provide information about the technical parameters of the model execution, such as CPU usage, memory, uh, runtime, etc. The model runs its course, returns the predictions to the uh, S3 bucket from which an existing uh, application uh, can retrieve the results. So that's basically the, the entire production platform as it can work. Uh, if we could go please to the next one. Yes, so talking about the technical part is, is one element of it, but the ML ops machine learning operations also consist processes. And this is one of the elements is the change management. So when we in need to introduce a change in the model, when we need a new version of the model in the production system, it does not occur in the vacuum. We need a reason for that. And we need a, an appropriate flow that will make sure that these, these requests are processed in appropriate prioritization. We, we identified four main reasons. So we can have a technical malfunction when the consumers cannot access the model or its result. We can have a change in the data structure that needs to be addressed and the model has to be reworked to accommodate it. We can have a change of the existing business rules that will result in a different needs or again, modifying the existing results from the ML predictions. And of course, we can have just another technical feature that will improve model predictive capabilities. So all of these, uh, all of these needs are coming in the initiation part and are dropped in a backlog <clears throat> when our, through prioritizations are selected for development, which occurs in a separate environment and goes through its normal development cycle through the testing and then quality to stage four. And once the code is completed, deemed to be worthy, it's put in the appropriate uh, branch in the GitHub repository. And then afterwards, the CICD pipelines are overtaking uh, it. So the code is passed to the production environment. The newer version of the model is uh, built and executed upon request with the results being sent to the S3 bucket and another uh, additional information is sent that the change has been successfully completed. So the appropriate stakeholder can be notified and then the uh, track changes can be tracked via appropriate monitoring. But change management process is one part of it. So if we go to the next slide, this is associated with roles and responsibilities of people. So we built a, a quite complex RACI matrix that identifies all the elements of the change management process and appropriate roles within stakeholders, data provider, data science team, and model consumers, and attributes them appropriate roles. So being responsible, accountable, consulted, and informed to make sure that all these changes are, again, not happening in the vacuum and are not creating a situation when unknown and unexpected change is put in production, potentially adversely affecting the business, uh, negative PR, or endangering KPIs and OKRs. So that's how we see ML ops in, in an absolute nutshell from the production perspective of a single model that we managed to, to, to build for our client. And I would like to thank you at this point and pass it to Sharif, who will tell you more about the data quality. Thank you. Yeah, let's start with data quality and why it's uh, important. As all of us, you know, uh, data quality here plays an important role in any uh, data management process and in machine learning. Organizations rely on data to make a decision. If this decision based on inaccurate data or data with errors or uh, inconsistency, for sure it can do more harm than good. 
that's why data quality is very important if we are going to make a decisions. Also, if we are going to identify trends and patterns. Uh, of course, uh, with good data, it will reduce the cost. And uh, to actually understand what is the difference between poor data quality and high data quality, here we need first of all uh, to have a platform to, and also we need to understand what is the data quality dimensions. We can start with the first one, which is uh, completeness. Uh, for sure, data comes from different sources, and this can actually cause uh, several issues uh, related to the data and the completeness of the data. And here, if you are going to use a platform to identify, like let's say, null data, and they can kind of check this completeness, and also you can measure it. The same here for the accuracy. Uh, data here is based on um, uh, several, let's say, stages, like you ingest the data, you do some transformations, and uh, after that, maybe here you, you will find the data is not accurate. It's different from the source due to some transformation or wrong transformations. Also, that's why you need here a platform or framework to make sure the data here is accurate. The same if we are talking about uh, inconsistency between the data and also because as, as, as I already mentioned, data comes from different sources, maybe that leads to different formats and this can be uh, can cause uh, inconsistency in the data. For sure, also due to, uh, uh, let's say, data comes in real time, some of them in new real time, some of them in a different frequency on daily basis, this can also lead to use uh, of outdated data. So based on that, you need also uh, this tool to, to make sure that you already use, um, you already not used outdated data. And validity to make sure, uh, let's say, the types of the data, the formats and everything is, based, uh, is, is, is incorrect before using the data. And the last thing, and this is like the very important, which is uniqueness. You need here to make sure there is no duplication, especially if you are talking about any aggregation, like uh, net sales. If you have here a duplication, for sure you are going to make a wrong decision and it will harm the business. Based on that, you need here to know, okay, this is like the data quality dimensions. And we need a um, tool or uh, technology that can be used to improve the data quality to catch these issues. Uh, for that, that's what I'm going to uh, check with you. Next slide, which is the tools and which tool we are going to use. Um, in this project, we already assessed several uh, tools, and uh, I'm going to share with you two of them only, because uh, both of them, let's say, are based on open source, and also uh, both of them have similar features. It's very important when you are going to select the tool, you know, uh, the requirements, the business requirements, and also uh, to check uh, if this tool will fit uh, the needs from, let's say, based on the requirements. And as you can see here, we checked uh, great expectations versus uh, PYDQ from different features, like number of checks, the contributions, and the usability, and so on. For example, both of them, let's say here, uh, are similar, but we decided to um, proceed with great expectations. Due to uh, great expectations, they can connect it to uh, different data sources and they can execute the validations in the backend of these sources. In our project, we have BigQuery, Athena, uh, SS3 buckets, and so on. So we don't need here to move the data and to keep the data in memory or using a Spark to validate the data. Great expectations can actually validate the data in the source. Uh, also, uh, if we are talking about flexibility and uh, if you would like to customize the tool, great expectations here uh, has good feature. And also we already customized this 
customized uh, great expectations, uh, um, as I will show it to you in the next slide. So the conclusion, actually, uh, we, uh, we decided to use great expectations in this project. And for sure, maybe in a different project, maybe DQ will be uh, the best based on the requirements and uh, business needs. So now, what is the great expectations? Great expectations here can be used with existing data sources or data assets you have, like BigQuery, Athena, S3, and so on. The execution of the validations will be done in the backend of these um, data sources. So you will not move the data from uh, BigQuery into a memory, and after that, you are going to execute uh, the validations. This is a very important feature if we are talking about great expectations and also the size of the data we have. And uh, this is, can be started with anyone who is familiar with the Jupyter Notebook. So uh, they can start to define the rules. And also there is a good option in great expectations can, uh, that can help you to uh, validate the data or suggest which validations can be used. And after that, you can check the expectations, which is like uh, something like unit tests, like uh, if this column is null or not, if uh, if we have the right schema and so on. And uh, you, you can decide actually which validations you would like to apply. And these validations will be saved as a JSON file in a centralized place. And then with any integration tool, for, for example, in our project, we have uh, Airflow as an orchestration tool. This orchestration tool just will call great expectation to perform the validations. And the validations here will be performed in the backend. So the, also the performance will be good. So Airflow or any command, you can actually uh, execute the validations. And after that, you can uh, monitor and uh, check the data. It will provide you with a high quality of data and also this data documentation so anyone can read it, uh, uh, even the business, and they can understand the agreement between, let's say, the source and uh, the transformation. And also you are going to receive uh, alerting or logging if there is anything went wrong. And we already customized this to uh, send the notifications into Microsoft Teams. This is not a built-in function in great expectations. So by the end, you are going to receive a notification mentioning everything is good, and you can open the data docs to check the validations and the result, or maybe something went wrong, as you can see in red, and uh, you can open the data docs to check what exactly is the issue. And that's it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Sheriff. Uh, for for explaining, we are colleagues uh, going big steps uh, to the end of the of the presentation. But be, before we summarize, uh, let's also take a view on how we can approach such delivery. So, from what we've heard already, and we covered only a piece of the of this challenging problem, it's quite big. Um, Productionization of, of even a simple model that is an uh, application of, of well-known algorithms and uh, on, a, on a collected data requires a number of actions and, and, and it causes a lot of challenges. Some of them are technical, you know, how to interconnect everything, how to set up proper uh, development environment, production environment, proper separation, how to manage data, how to uh, provide more ops-related uh, techniques, like, you know, monitoring of a model, monitoring of what's going on in the in the production, to monitor also model quality in time, etc. Some of them are typically organizational, so how to set up the governance process around it, uh, how to agree on the responsibilities of, of each of the elements and the RACI matrix. And even if we know the solution for that and we have a blueprint, you know, then we usually work in a kind of a multi-vendor environment with lots of stakeholders, a uh, lot of businesses, and it needs to be done with all proper respect for everybody and need to be aligned with everyone. So it's a really rare situation when you go with a blueprint and there are no comments and, and it's things going smooth. So it's, it's kind of a challenging thing and uh, of course other challenges like you know compliance uh, legal problems etc everything need to need to resolve often by uh, you know uh, collaboration with proper departments uh, on the client side so you have a number of uh, 
of, of things to do. And for that reason, going with the you know, full uh, scale MLOps framework is usually impossible with one step. Uh, you would, uh, it's like, you know, co comparison between Inmon and Ken Kendall approach to building, uh, or maybe even now data vault approach to building uh, uh, warehousing solutions. So the more lean approach, the faster you can provide value and show the value of what you're doing, the better for you and the better for the, uh, for the product and the team. And for that reason, it's usually good to split it both on the uh, scope of what you want to do and maturity of, of elements, focusing on the core things that need to be solved first and continuing in the next step if next iterations and that's also the approach we uh, we implemented here and we can go to the next slide um, to make maybe just a last comment about uh, the organization of, of, of work uh, it's still feasible to go agile with it and especially when you have a lots of stakeholders and lots of interactions with different uh, stakeholders it's quite important the only difference, I think, is a little bit around the uh, product ownership and and how to define architecture. So let's let's say this this collaboration about the uh, in the middle of technical and non-technical uh, things. So uh, here, how we how we usually approach, we are the consultancy on AI and ML. It's a huge momentum for this technology, but still it requires a proper uh, explanation, especially when collaborating with more business stakeholders and, and, and quite too many uh, other stakeholders. Because I, what, what we believe, the mutual understanding on how we progress, uh, what are our actions, what is motivation behind it, what is the expected result, and this transparent way of going forward is uh, for simplifying collaboration and making things uh, going quite smooth. The rest of the organization is quite agile and is going quite uh, smoothly uh, forward. And of course, uh, this, this data delivery management is still a very challenging area, but uh, so applying best practices here, I think, are quite successful. And colleagues, let me this way end up the, the, the main part and maybe pass the voice to, to Michal, uh, who will, uh, can take his voice on that and also summarize the, uh, the, the presentation. Yeah, so I think that to that next extent, I'm going to reiterate what you just said. You know, implementation of the AI models or ML models is multi-level problem. It has got multiple different layers of complexity, and those lie across business and the IT, right? When we spoke, we speak about the business, and those are definitely the, the challenges that we came across. It's is the trust as well, right? We have people who are on the on the on the field or in the, the in, who, who always who think that they know better, right? Why do I, why should I trust the model where I, I know how to do certain things in my, in my own way? Uh, there's also that problem around, you know, when do you stop building the models? You const constantly iterate the models. When is that moment in time when something is production ready? And I, I think that the, the, the most fundamental element is that we, you need to implement the models into the production systems to be truly operational. You cannot have those models just stored, stored on your PCs because they will fade away within a couple of months. So you need to figure out the way how you can implement or kind of incorporate the, the models and AI to help people do their job. That often also requires to change the way how they do their jobs or how, uh, how they come about uh, performing their daily tasks. That is a challenge on its own. And then when we look into the AI, it's, uh, it's also an ML. It's still quite a, quite a new, um, it's getting momentum at the moment, but it's still a new, uh, quite a new field when it comes to com commercializing some, some of those elements, especially at the scale we are talking at the moment. So there are also certain uh, changes that need to happen at the organizational level in terms of uh, how we deliver those products, how team uh, get organized, and how we actually maintain the models in the production systems. So even at, when we look at the, at the tech level, right, we have to address the issues uh, that lead to some of the lack of trust on the business level. Is the data quality that the team just described? Is the data hygiene? Is the observability? It's our ability to run the models in production system that uh, that is not going to be distorted, and also introducing some good practices into the area that normally was occupied by the data science group that don't always look into those kind of uh, elements that are related to sustainability of a solution or monitoring alerting, that they don't always have expertise in that area and they, they require the, the, the additional support. Obviously, there are changes, aspects related to the change management, the whole ML ops area. We need to create sound environments in which we can deploy the models, we can measure the models, and we also need to be able to, re to receive the feedback loops so that we can we can also understand is that model improving is it is 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 it dec decreasing its accuracy or what we need to do in order to 
um, to address those problems. Obviously, the problem is very complex, and you know the number, uh, as it is in the big data world, uh, the number of tools is enormous. So you need to choose what uh, what you really need for your specific use case to be as 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 broad as possible, but at the same time fulfilling your kind of basic requirements. And that's the approach that we actually have taken out of all of the tools that are available uh, out there on the markets and certain bl blueprints that are available at EPAM. We selected certain that are um, uh, that are give us the broad enough impact to the organization upon which we can actually expand with additional use cases. So holistically, we address the key problems that are related to um, data quality, separation of the environments, and uh, as well as uh, MLOps related to observability, monitoring, and model deployment. Um, um, and I think that 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 is the approach that that is going that build foundation for uh, further implementations that uh, that are coming um, ahead and more models that will be able to uh, that will be able to follow the similar path in the future. Okay. I don't know, Marek, if you would like to add anything else on the top. I think, Michal, you exhausted the uh, the summary the subject. totally. Sorry, thank you very much, guys. Now let's move to the questions. Uh, yeah, the first question, maybe, yeah, probably a hot topic. How do you ensure compliance with regulations such as GDPR or alike? Uh, since you <laughs> contemplated using the user sessions and uh, to refine recommendations? Well, this is a long topic, probably a session on its own, but uh, in general, to, to approach it, we have to remember that GDPR is not a regulation that is designed to stop doing anything, but it's, de it's designed to make sure that the data is used in a lawful, fair and transparent manner with a limited purpose that is only consisting minimal amount of data that is accurate, stored for a limited time, that is operated, analyzed, processed and stored with integrity and confidentiality, and of course, accountability. And this is what GDPR stands for. So overall, you have to inform your clients or potential users that the data is going to be used to build recommendations and give them option to opt out of such, uh, mm, sorry, you have to, according to GDPR, you have to ask them for an explicit opt-in to allow to participate in building that data. Of course, the, those uh, those providers that are currently managing this type of information are <clears throat> available through multiple websites and we know very well how it does. It could be also included in terms and conditions of using appropriate websites or services, et cetera. So the, the, the main point is about making sure that the client is informed about this, that the intention is to, to use such data and how to use it. And of course, to ensure a compliance with other GDPR processes, such as removal of the data upon request, making sure that the data is timely, that it's not stored indefinitely, et cetera. Yeah, thank you. So we also have some more question uh, yeah, regarding the beginning of the presentation regarding the recommender systems. Uh, so you described several recommender system types and uh, which should be used for what? So can we use like any of these recommender system types for anything like maybe music, movies, clothes? Or... Maybe uh, let me let me cover this uh, this topic, uh -huh. and uh, maybe Lan, one one word to to what Tomek just said. Uh, we we of course focus on GDPR because we quite well know it, but you know we must be aware that there are different regulations for different countries, and the market is not only EMEA or not only Europe uh, uh, as it is. So usually it's also strong collaboration with uh, with legal departments. So it's it's impossible to to make a decision on it. On behalf of someone's data, that's uh, that's we are we are partnering, no, not taking over what's going to happen. Uh, with the question about uh, what sort of recommender systems can be used and how to do it, so uh, I would like to just stress two two things. One thing, when you remember this uh, this little GIF uh, image uh, with uh, users and interactions, so interactions are exactly the same regardless the item. So if we consider interaction, of course, we can define them in a different way. If you consider interaction as explicit uh, expression of uh, some, someone likes uh, something by you know, giving four or five stars, that's one of the sort, or maybe just NPS kind of a grading between you know, one and 10. That's one of the explicit things. You can grade this way, movie, 
clothes, whatever you want to. Uh, it's, if it's more implicit, like, you know, purchase, it's again, it's a binary. I purchase a product. I, I know I purchase it and it does kind of interaction. And regardless what is an item, this interaction will be represented the same. It's just a, a user item matrix and, and that's all. Of course, when it comes to content features, it's different uh, because we, you describe clothes, uh, music and movies differently. You know? They are different features and attributes. And um, I wouldn't say uh, that's the second part. There is one uh, silver bullet to solve the problem. So usually when you approach, and this is something not tackled here because we uh, we just supported the team that already did this job and did this job really great. But um, usually you experiment with data. So you have a plethora of various techniques. If you want to start very fast, you can use kind of an auto ML approach. Uh, the biggest challenge is to find a reasonable data representation, and you know the more features, of course, you can uh, extract, uh, the more you know things you can you can select, and then simply to compare results based on the uh, on the problem you would like to solve. If the problem is uh, I don't know to optimize the just the uh, re regression of uh, of the rate that the new user would do. Would, would give to the new product that's that well-defined problem and you can compare how different approaches handle with it um, of course the more experience you have the easier for you to figure out which solutions will be uh, better this or that case and you can maybe a bit optimize time of finding the best approach but um, end of the day it's always kind of a little bit of research uh, about finding the the right solution You are on mute, Alexander, I think. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, and I think that concludes our session. So thank you all so much for joining us today. We hope you found this session insightful and inspiring. In the video description below, you will find the link to the talk page where you can ask some additional questions to our speakers and they will answer it offline. Uh, you can also find the a form where you can provide your feedback to this talk if you like or if you don't like it. You can give uh, speakers pages and trade the session. Additionally, I'd like you, if you'd like to revisit it, like watch recording or maybe download presentation file, so you can find uh, it on talk page. So check the description of this video below and find the link. Uh, thank you all so much, guys. Thank you for coming. It couldn't happen without you. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thank you.